Assalamualaikum and good afternoon to all. During this talk, kindly silence your microphone to ensure smooth welcome. Thank you for your cooperation. Again, Assalamualaikum and good afternoon to everyone. During this talk, kindly silent your microphone to ensure a smooth program. Thank you for your cooperation.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening to our honorable guests, Adjunct Professor E.R. Hijaz Kastui, Professor TPR Dr. Jamalulai Abu Mahdin of FSPU UITM Campus Lama, Associate Professor T.S. Dr. Emma Marini Ahmad Zawawi, Deputy Dean Academic of FSPU UITM, Wan Nik Fahana Nik Azhari, Head of Center of Studies Architecture, E.R. Putri Mayam Bahja Zahari, Program Coordinator, Bachelor of Science, Honors Architecture, Puan Sharifa Asmah Tuan, the senior leader of Master Architecture 04. Architects, professor, associate professors, lecturers, fellow students, and all those who attend. My name is Ethan Shahira Azhari, and I will be your moderator for today's day. The theme of our talk is Architecture for People in Malaysia Context. This talk is part of an architectural dialogue series hosted by Kamerika Studio and brought to you by USQ and Arkisa. For information, this talk will be recorded and will be posted on Arkisa YouTube channel. First and foremost, let us start this beautiful day with the blessing and mercy from the Almighty with Alpha Tihari Sadish. Amin Amin Ya Rabbal Alameen. To begin this talk, we are pleased to have our Dean of FSPU IDEM Campus Lango, Professor TPR Dr. Jamalulai Abdullah to deliver the opening remarks. Please welcome. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to everybody. Okay, uh, so Izan, can you hear me? Yes, okay. very clear. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, I'd like to invite everybody here for the talk uh, by our adjunct professor, E.R. Hijaz Kasturi. Uh, uh, thank you very much to our adjunct professor, E.R. Hijaz, for uh, spending the time and then sharing your best experience to all of us here. And then uh, and uh, I'd like to congratulate the students of uh, architecture, okay. Uh, Akisa as well as Kalam Studio for organizing this uh, webinar here and we are really hoping that uh, this one is going to be the start of uh, of a series of webinar where we're going to have uh, more people uh, and more speakers uh, to talk about the issues in architecture and the built environment and it's really a great uh, start that we have our uh, beloved and distinguished uh, adjunct professor Arhijas Kasturi uh, to share his experience today. And those who are here, uh, actually in the groups, not just from uh, FSP UITM, but also include from uh, lecturers and students from uh, the built environment uh, department uh, around Malaysia. And we also post it also to our partners internationally. So I hope uh, all of you, uh, we, we will enjoy uh, the talk by A.R. Hijaz Kasturi and then uh, I'm happy to say that we have now more than 250 participants and I'm sure the number will increase as well. So uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Ajang Professor A.R. Hijaz and then uh, congratulations to the organizer and then uh, thank you uh, to everybody for joining uh, our webinar today. Uh, okay, and so I pass it back to Izan Shaira to uh, introduce our yeah, distinguished yeah. professor. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dean, for the wonderful remarks. Um, the main objective of today's talk is to share and discuss knowledge regarding architecture for people. Through this knowledge sharing session, we hope to get critical insights and on the topic of interest. Before we pass our baton to honorable speaker for today, we would we are proud to introduce our speaker, adjunct professor E.R. Hijaz Kasturi. 
He was born in Singapore on 26 September 1956 and had practiced internationally and locally. He has been recognized by Folks Asia as Heroes of Philanthropy in 2011. Active for more than 50 years, he has been responsible for some of the most significant buildings in Southeast Asia in the modern, postmodern, and constructivism styles. He is considered the father of Malaysian architecture of the second half of the 20th century. He was also the founder of School of Art and Architecture Institute Technology Mara ITM and the master planner of ITM Complex at Shah Alam. Currently, he has been appointed as adjunct professor for Faculty of Architecture, Planning and Surveying. So what is architecture for people? Has architecture lost touch with people? Buildings are designed for functions that serve the people. Architecture is about what is rational and practical, functional and conducive. How neutral and efficient should architecture be in Malaysia context? Now, without further ado, with much honor, I would like to invite our honorable speaker, adjunct professor A.R. Hijaz Kasri to begin the sharing session. Please welcome. First number one, quick. Um, and we'll just be sharing our screen. Hold on one second. Yes, we can show you. Sorry, one moment. You speak through that straight away. Right? Yes. Okay, can you see me? Hello? Yes, we can. Very clear. Thank you. Yes, right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good afternoon to you all. I've been asked for the topic today is on architecture for people. And I add later on also to include in Malaysia in particular. So I shall begin now with the topics. Architecture ought to be for the people in all in an ideal situation. However, the true fact remains that not all architectures are designed for people at large, but for specific people and specific need by those that commissions for the project. They are designed for particular purpose and for particular set of people, either individual, group, and institution. This is what is missing in many parts of our communications, townships, and the world for that matter. architecture that stands alone to the people around them, especially at ground, ground zero level, became isolated like a tombstones in the pictures that you see. Going back into history, tribal villages had their chiefs or headmen or the elderly govern the people as how they should live and conduct themselves. In the medieval period, the kings and their noblemen provide shelters for their people and subjects in the form of stockings and castles to protect them against the invading enemies. In ancient Egypt, the pharaohs and their priests dictated the scope of the architecture, mainly concentrated on palaces, places of worship, tombs, and shrines. 
the people were divided into two main categories, the upper echelons and the slaves, who did all the donkey works for their kind of architecture. Likewise, the early Greece and the Roman Empire were the same in dealing with their own architecture for the glory of respecting their gods. Temples and major entertainment centers flourished, such as the Colosseums, stadia, libraries, and open theaters. They were meant for the privileged class, while the rest, especially the non-nationals and the slaves, become the butts of their workforce and sacrificial entertainment. As you can see for the gladiators that you enjoy in the movies. Places for the people were mainly concentrated for administrative convenience and political, and political meeting. These places were known as agora in the beginning, squares, plazas, forums, Can you hear me? Yeah. It was uh, yeah. perhaps it was perhaps after the first industrial revolutions and the French revolutions for becoming republic that changed the emphasis of architecture for the people. It was the beginning of democracy. The government ruled by the people for the people. Even so, the head of the government at that time maintained the status of emperor, which they should be president in states or prime ministers. The architecture then provides spaces and places for people from all walks of life and offered freedoms of movement free speeches along with opportunities for work and business. Other human needs sprouted naturally, like shops, entertainment centers, colleges, libraries, opera houses, and sporting arenas. Their needs were supported by the architecture of their time, limited only by technology, workforce, materials, and of course, economics. They were exciting places to be found around the world. They provided the people with richness of living experience, especially at the peak of their civilizations. To pick a few of them as examples would be cities like Paris, London, and Venice. All the components of architecture in Paris grew from the people's needs, evolving great architecture in their splendor and glory. Paris has the best and largest gallery in the world that the world could offer. So is the Congress Hall, theaters, universities, shopping malls, the best, and entertainment centers, of course. And of course, that famous boulevard. Sometimes they build that through accidents, as you know, the making of boulevards in Paris is by the houseman through the, through the governments of the Emperor Napoleon I. So you see a beautiful places in Paris that people enjoy and, and cultures flourish as well. It's a great place for work studies, entertainment, and it is a livable place. Followed with London, you have a great place like the Piccadilly Circus and around Trafalgar Square. They too have their boulevards, the, the Paul Mall, but everything else are all around it. 
even the palaces, the Buckingham Palace, also in the center of the cities. This is really, in a way, a very compact cities, a cities that you can walk from one place to another. And the best, one of the best places is, of course, Venice. It contains all the best with St. Mark's at the center for people's entertainment and meeting places and, and castles as well. And it is in this special place of Venice that excludes all together's motor cars. And you are safely going from one place to another for your work, pleasure, sleeping and entertainment and so on in one small place. That has been the kind of models that many parts of the world followed. With attractions like that, people gravit gravitated to these kind of places until they become too big and internationalized that these centers starting to be demon dehumanized and alienated. With the onslaught of vehicular traffic, architecture is no longer for people, but for vehicular traffic, as you can experience today, including in our own towns and city. Development in Malaysia is just the same. And now I come into our own cities, how it was built before. Through the influence of the Western world, the British colonies at that time, we were governed by them, by the British, and influenced by their way of, of, of architecture in many ways, especially in urban planning. We have the squares for the congregation of the people and around these squares lies the, the big buildings, which is important of that, of, for the government of the colonial era, such as the uh, court, the high court, the town hall, the library beside that, and of course the padang, uh, not only meant for them or for, for people congregation, but for their cricket and, and their clubhouse also flanking in front of them. Everything is compact. The center of the city, of course, is at the confluence of the river where the business tribe at that time was the discovery of tin. And along that, we have a lot of shop houses, all at human scales that is protected from the weather and it is open day and night. It is quite a vibrant city an example of a good living. And like all other towns, we, in, in particular with Kuala Lumpur, it's unique in, the, in that sense. It's not only from one for the purpose of one national, for, but, but for multi-racial community. It is a very tolerant city in many ways than one. You have the big cathedral in, this, in the heart of the city. You also have the mosques, the Hindu temples, and the Chinese temples as well, right in the middle and that. And, and we have the special people as well of different ethnic group. It's really a multi-national society. It is unique in that way because whatever the people needs must include for all races and all religion of the time. But that, that example is follows the British rules and regulation in terms of architecture and in terms of planning as well. But with the exceptions, at least those days, the governments of those days have sympathy towards our culture. Paramount being the Islamic society and some of the big building, the major public building reflects that. Not quite Islamic in that sense, but nearest what they can do by the architects of that time. We follow the Moorish kind of architectures. 
and sometimes we follow the the Indian architectures as well as the Chinese. Melting together to make new kind of Malaysian architectures. It was a very good cities, cosmopolitans, multiracial societies, very tolerant until it become bigger. And that's where the difficulty lies. The descent was too far. And we have to commute very far away with the result that we have to use vehicle and choke the city. So what is then the goal of architecture for people? If we really want to create architecture for people, we must consciously allow for easy interaction for people. The building should be of human scale and we should create places and spaces for people's accessibility and connectivity, not only in the building, but around the building. These buildings and spaces, wherever possible, should be used day and night in order to bring vibrancy and economic returns and to avoid eerie, dead and unsafe spaces. And especially, we should focus on using fewer personal vehicles. Of course, we have good examples uh, like the KL city centers that has a compact use of big shopping centers with different from activities, including a very grand scales of garden, the moss and all other activities that required. But unfortunately, it's only for the, the rich few that can afford the place and housing, if any, at that, at that centers are very, very expensive and meant for the privileged few. So how should be designed for the future? Now, at, at every phase, our human settlement is a change. And sometimes it's a drastic change and that influence our needs and that's influence architecture. In the first industrial revolution, you have the discovery of irons, ore, and the steam engines. And then the manufacturing process that started in Britain and Europe changed the world in a way of how they live and work. Continuing with that, you have the second industrial revolution, the discovery of electricity and the dependency on oils and the machinery and energies are derived from them. The third industrial revolution is the logistics and communication system that we have and the proliferation of the motor cars as a, our main vehicle of services and transport. And that's where the killer becomes and choking the cities. And now we are in the third industrial revolutions of digital technologies. What are we looking for? Perhaps with this pandemic times that force us to rethink how we should live in the future. Uh, with new technology, surely we don't have to depend with, with the old tricks and principles of human settlements. <coughs> the principles of urban living is always not only the principles of living in planning, it's always is the triangles, as you know, a place to live, place to work and leisures. And that is the continuation of that. And if you have to have this, and as the city get become bigger and bigger, the distance of travel from one place to another become greater and the city become a sprawling city, as you can see around the world as well. So how big should be the city be to be most, but how small the, the city should be to be uh, viable, to have a compact cities, to have a compact cities. The recommendation is perhaps that the area should not be more than 800 meters around 
and the walking distance is to be 10 minutes in order to have a really viable, compact and livable city for human being. Of course, these got to contain what's the need for today's uh, modern people, such as from, from this diagram that you can see, lo local shopping centers, local health facilities and services, schools, learning centers all around it, as you can see in this diagram, that's the requirement of today's. Cities must be sustainable as well. And what is the characteristic, characteristic that we require? It, it is right at the top is to be well run, a good governance, well connected with transport and connectivity, well served, would that have good service throughout and good environments, equity for all people, not only for the rich and the poor, not only for one, one race or another, but, but multiracial. Economy that is thriving, that is required and well designed for housing people and active, inclusive and to be safe and to be culturally, cultural center as well. Right. I'll well, give you an example how we could do this. Shop house is number one, you can see on that diagram. Shop houses, the identity, the traditional shop house is a prime identity of the dwelling community. Each one is uniquely defined by the owner's sense of taste and functionality. Two, the streets, the attractions, the gathering of unique dwellings that create between spaces for economic and social opportunities. And three, community, the neighborhood, a community that self sustain by maintaining its own facilities and security, not to be far away from it. Four, high rise, the density, if it's ever required, community spaces are traded with dwelling efficiency, individuality, traded with consistency and economy. Then we build affordable housing that is dense, but respond to our environment. In our competition that we enter for the Habitat 67 for Penang, we illustrate how it can be done uh, to get the density that we require. In this case, uh, we plan for a six storage buildings, but rather than just a box like architectures, it's perforated. It is in and out with the center space for meeting the people. The corridor is not just a monotonous, boring corridors, but interspace inter with, with a zigzagging through the space into the dwelling areas. And in the bottoms are all the facilities that are required, like the old shop houses uh, for businesses, <laughs> entertainment, entertainment, schools, and all that. In a way, it is can be a very compact in a small space space and yet it can provide all the facilities for the mankind for the people and the top of the roof also it can go even as far as to have our farming to be done on top of the of the roof this is what the singapore government's now trying to do to make their roof is is uh, not only livable but also uh to have agricultural products. Not only in this way that you can do it uh, by, you can see in the diagram, it's perforating with center open. And not only it is has space on the ground for people to mingle around, interact with each other with all kind of activities, but it also can be an exciting place and exciting architecture for the people. Here is the illustrations. You don't have to have a flat face. You can get it very interesting facades and also to protect not only from the sun and rain, but from the radiation as well. And if you have to do green, you can also introduce green facades as well. So it's just to show the example that we can.
this. You need to me. Can you hear me again, please? Because he was muted just now. Hello? Yes. yes. Okay, so yes. continuing with that, you can see this map of variations. Not what you have seen today, all the dark facades. And really, the architecture is not for the people, only for the people, specific people that live in that. So continuing with that, with that we have another example that we do, if we have to do, to provide spaces for car parks, bury them all together and never see them. As they come into this community or settlement, they all be hidden underneath the buildings. And if you even have to employ or high density building, you can make it attractive by distancing each others, by playing the form or in the height and using the platform on the top to be completely pedestrianized. This is, this will be an example that we, we see before and, and try to use the roof space as well for the greenery. And so this is part of it that we can show. Yeah. But surely with the new revolutions, which uh, what we have today, we can build better. We don't have to travel long distances to reach our place. As it is now, the pandemic forced us to work at home. And if you translate that and extend that ideas, we can work at home. We can stop our long distance travel. We, have, we can have a good community. And when we do our architecture, it is really to think for the people and making places and so on. Thank you. So that's the end of that talk. All right. Um, thank you so much for an interesting talk. Um, now we are at the Q&A station. Anyone has any question? I'm sure a jump of air he just because we would be pleased to answer and share his experience. So if any of the architects, lecturers or students, audiences have some thoughts, ideas, questions, suggestions, and even experience that you yourself want to share, please don't hesitate to share them with us. And please introduce yourself before submit the question, please. Thank you. No, normally the lecturer starts first. Anybody? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, my question is, what do you think the actual problem? Is it, I mean, in implementing those ideas, what is the actual problem? Is it the problem the architect doesn't have the awareness or the developers doesn't, doesn't have the awareness or the policy, the government. What is the what is the challenge in implementing all these ideas? The challenge today is the authorities, and many architects has duty bound and the hands were more or less tight because of this requirement. The authorities that has not been kept up to date with that advancement of civilization with the changes and so on. We, our rules and regulations for buildings as well for urban planning is derived from the British, the colonial era. And we did not change it ourselves to meet for our purpose. We literally take down that. For example, you know, in many other cities, example, that they forbid cars going to the cities. Even in Paris today, they don't build car parks in the cities. And if you really want to bring your cars, then you suffer the consequences of congestions and so on and so forth. So they themselves restrict themselves to that. But what, what we, we do in our own cities, we allow them. In fact, not only 
not we allow them, we ask them to get more. At one time in uh, 20 years ago, the ratio for car park to the city that require was 100 square meter per car. Now they ask for 48 meter per so. And now our building in the cities and so on, you, you just build first the car park, the convenience of the car park, not the convenience for the people. And this, I think those responsible in putting the rules and guidelines for our, for our future must change that quickly, must change that towards new civilization. So, any more? That was a good question, actually. So, Very relevant. so actually, even if the architects, they have the awareness, it still won't work if the government does not support it. Correct. That's correct. It's all depending on what, what kind of it is. In effect, today, what architects are building, they follow, you know, all the rule and regulation in every sense in, in that way. They don't even think about culture. They don't even think about, you know, aesthetics. It's purely functional, purely built according to rules and regulations of what been imposed today. So we are perhaps waiting again from the West to change this idea. You know, it is just like that. In, in the new communities or new civilization or new governments, you know, we follow so far everything. What we do, we follow from the West. In fact, the whole world is following the West, including China. Imagine in China, when they build a building, they just build and imitate the West. Only just, just recently, the new laws take into place that in future, they don't allow imitation of buildings from the West. They should think for themselves and that reflects their culture, the needs of the people. It's only now it is coming from the top. But we in our place today, we are still in the lull. We are still sleeping. Okay. I hope it's clear for you, Amma. <laughs> yes, yeah. Assalamu alaikum, Prof. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Yes. Uh, okay, my name is Mazni. Uh, I am a lecturer from Tourism Department in International Islamic University in Pago, Johor. I have two questions. Um, before that, thank you very much for your slide. I'm very impressed. Very beautiful slides. Uh, my first question is, um, how far is the architecture uh, for people in Malaysia uh, compared to other countries? Are we uh, compatible or far behind or advanced than them? My second question is, since I'm from tourism, uh, I would like to know, um, what is your opinion about the design or architecture uh, towards uh, people because uh, tourism involves a lot of people, right? Yes. So, what do you think of uh, the the, devel uh, the recent development in the architecture, especially in Malaysia? Thank you. Okay, in the first place, what we design today is we follow. We we are really up to date and is as good as any other professional in the world because of our good education in many ways. And in the beginning, many of us, or the architects principally, are educated overseas. Unfortunately, when they came back, when they came back, they followed the principles what had been taught for them in different schools. And, and there's no coherence or unity among the architects in Malaysia to do into a, a kind of strategy or movement for that matters. And that's what we are. We just build and in the end, we just build for the sake of, of economic returns and discarded the aesthetics, the cultural value and the needs 
for a people, for people. I give you an example. You know, when we, we study in the West and even we study in here, for example, we follow the program that follow in a way from the Western uh, models, right? And the Western model is really very good in that sense, but we must know how far we should follow and how far we should go. Okay. There is a limitation to that, for example. We must know that when we study, especially overseas, the technology is really the uppermost, it's the best of, of you can get. The knowledge given throughout history or the principle of design and so on is, is second to none. But they don't, they don't teach you aesthetics. They don't tell you about culture. And that's another sphere. In fact, in a way, it's so modernized today, and that they become internationalized. They do the same thing everywhere else, but surely there's something wrong in that. And this is what we have neglected, and we're not putting really emphasis on that. Our culture, our religion, should not be incorporated in in our own architecture. The answer is yes. You know, when I was given the religions have been incorporated. In some, they have done all the time. In particular, in one of our my personal job in the beginning is to build uh, the the resort hotels uh, in the East Coast, and it was uh, committed. Um, Club Mediterranean is called. And even in Club Mediterranean, right. the uh, proposals and came from, from, from French, for example. They give us the brief that they want Malaysian architecture, if possible, regional architectures. And I ask them why? Because if people come overseas, want to come to your country, they don't want to see the same building like in their country. They want to see something different, something uniqueness. The food also, they want to try something different. And because of that, what you see Club Mediterranean buildings in Chirating is completely regional and Malaysian at that, except its technology is keeping up France. And that's why people like to see it. Yeah. And so we should follow the same trend Recently, I just finished our family resort hotel. We follow the same thing too. And today it is most popular resort hotel. It's expensive, but people like to go there. That shows that how, what people appreciate. But unfortunately, many of these building that we see is a nondescript kind of building. It has no personality, let alone uh, it, putting some cultures in it for the, our own people, for our own values and so on. It's completely retarding that. It's following just for the function, for the returns. Okay, next one. All right, um, I think I should- okay, Thank you, Prof, uh, thank you very much. Because uh, I just highlighted because recently we have uh, tourists who are interested to come to Malaysia. But uh, one of the comments is why we are showing them uh, a lot of nice building, but not Malaysian's identity. <laughs> exactly. Okay, exactly. Thank you, Prof. Thank you exactly. very much. Yes, in, in order to find out that Malaysian identity is very difficult. And people always ask me, um, you know, show me uh, what is the dogma of, of Malaysian identity. I said, creativity has no dogma. You, st you have to find a new one. You got to do it. And they're asking me, surely you can see the inspiration or the guideline in somewhere. No, if you have the guidelines, then, then it's, a, it's a dead aesthetics. But you can follow our pre predecessors, you know, uh, how they built before, how they designed batik, how they designed their houses or whatever it is, you know. 
what where where is the inspiration come from from the handicraft of the people what they can do from the materials available around them from what they see around them the plants the flowers from how they live this and that is surely the puncha as i said the foundation of new architecture that we can derive especially in malaysia we have very rich multiracial society indian cultures are very rich so is the chinese how can we blend them together and that it should be our challenge and that should be our future in the in the future not just building not just functions that's not enough for our soul next question thank you bro all right uh before that i would like to choose one of these many questions on the chat i think this is the latest about the current issue so good afternoon sir by mariani in the midst of the COVID situation, what are the significant architectural changes that can be implemented in commercial buildings nowadays to avoid deserted so-called white elephant buildings? Yes, that's a very interesting, of course. You know, other universities have making research, especially as I was told, uh, in some American universities, they are very, very deep in this research of what is the new kind of architecture should be bring or because of the pandemic. And, and this is really important, yeah? Now, how do we segregate people during, the, during this kind of, of pandemic situation? How you, when you distance yourself, of course, what the help we, we have today is good because of, of the technology that we have. We then have to meet each other to do works, for example, or communicate. We got all kinds of communication systems. And that's in a way how it can be built. And as I said before, we don't have to live, you know, in, in, in a big space together with every crowd dwelling on it. We can separate ourselves because of the technology. And in the future, we don't have to run our own car to go to the office and and waste all the energies and the time taken. And, and you know, to my dismay, the other day, just last week, I met a vice chancellor and he will travel from Kuala Lumpur, his house, to the place where he served for three hours journey every day. Don't you think that's a waste of time and energy? But he did that. And to me, you know, there are people like that, that, that spending time, you know, driving their cars. And, and that's a tragedy, not only wasting their time, which they can do more or enjoying their time, but also the energy spent. And today, if you want to think about it, you know, you don't have to drive yourself to the city. You know, you can have grabs, for example. In fact, it is cheaper if you really or uh, you know in monetary term to pay for whatever it is you mean it in a car it's cheaper to do that especially you only do it for five days in a week minus all the holidays which is abandoned in malaysia it become four days in a week so when you calculate four days in a week of that transportation system by by grab it is surely more economical to do that than to own the car so these are the changes that can be built tomorrow or designed tomorrow. We certainly got to think about it. Not only that, you know, do we need shopping centers? Maybe we don't because we can, we can buy all these things through internet anyway, and they can bring it to you in in most economical way. And in the future, uh, life can be gotten at, at a very economical system in many ways not only in services in many in many other areas including teaching including learning also looking at potential new product ideas uh, can you hear you 
Can't hear you. Can you repeat that again? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, yes. What was the question just now? I can't hear you, the last one. Um, the last question. That is a, that, that's not a question, actually. Okay, so, all right. right. Any so, more? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, someone requested me to um, ask, ask the, his, her question. Assalamualaikum, Yar Hijaz. Great input on the architecture of the people. I would like to ask regarding your opinion on sustainable green buildings in Malaysia nowadays. Is it merely for marketing purposes achieving GPI standards or is it done purely from the concern towards the environment to actually combat climate change? Of course, it's purely for the environment, you know, the climate change that we do. We always suffering as you know. Uh, so we got to stop that and we we'll be more conscious on that, just not for the sake of getting, you know, um, whatever we are looking for. And towards the future, all building will be will be designed to, uh, to achieve that. Already in some other countries like Singapore, they put it already in their codes or in the building codes as a, as a, as a necessity as we used to, to do it when we have some catastrophe, for example, fire, we get fire regulation into it, it becomes regulation embedded in, in, in design factors. So in the future, it will be a necessary thing that we have to safeguard our environment. And, and today, it is a less effect kind of thing. Those who want to do it, they will do it, otherwise, no. Well, why not it compulsory? Because it's necessary for our future survival. And through that kind of new factors, a new architecture will emerge and it could be very exciting. And the other exciting things, of course, that will emerge in new architecture is, is the logistic, the new kind of transportation system that we have, like a flying cars. The flying cars is not yet economical. If it is the flying cars can be gotten by everybody like a vehicle in the future, architecture will change. We normally, we don't need garages anymore. We we'll need garages up in the air. Well, we need a different kind of it. And this is really a great challenge for the future. Unfortunately, I, I will not live that long and to enjoy it and to observe it. Okay, right. there's another question there coming from somebody, Muhammad, I think it is. Okay, any more? Um, okay, um, I think before I proceed to another question, I would like to ask a question. It's talking about the survival you mentioned before. Um, when we talk about architecture for people, we talk about um, the urban and the sustainability. How about the unfortunate ones to survive in this current situation and in the next future? You're talking about the poor. Yes, the unfortunate ones. And the unfortunate ones. Yeah. At the moment, there is at the moment there is disparity between the rich and the poor, and we have. The world has not adjusted to that. The rich become so rich, the poor become so rich, never in between. But in between the era, the earlier era of civilization today, there is a compromise already. But in the future, it will be more, it will be more towards this. I think, and that is uh, something to look forward to. And, and because of that, we'll be in a way living in the same standards. It's the same way. We are beginning to do that anyway. Even the rich people, you know, only only in Malaysia probably or in the Southeast Asia probably, the rich people can afford to have a driver, for example. Abundance of, of helpers in the house, for example. Uh, the Western people, you know, even they are rich, millionaires or billionaires, could not afford that, could not do that. Not only afford. It's not a standard, it's not protocol anymore. So what is that? It means that 
the standard of living is almost equal, whether you're rich and small. And the question is why they want to become richer and richer. Because what can they do? They, can, they cannot wear two shirts at, in one, at, at one time, one at a time, anyway. So what is it that they do? They're doing it for nothing. So that is a future because human beings themselves will adjust it. You know, if not, we have war, of course, we have disparity between the rich and the poor. And that's where the start of the war. The the poor. And but tomorrow everything will be equalized and will be truly will be amazingly in that situation. All right. Dato, I have a question to you, Dato. Okay. Yes. Abdul Rahim from yes. UITM. I'm, I'm one of the academicians from UITM. Uh, a little bit on academic issues. Uh, we see sustainability, heritage and conservation have become more important now. And somehow rather it was left out earlier in the teaching of schools in Malaysian uh, schools. Uh, probably uh, trying to emulate what the Western life or living uh, with the understanding about our vernacular culture and identity. Uh, what would be your advice, Dato, for these schools uh, in order for them to see what's going to happen to the future? Dato. Yes, of course, it all got to start from the schools. I mean, and, and without that, uh, uh, we cannot go further than that. Of course, from time to time, we got to adjust ourselves, change our syllabus to what is relevant today not yesterday's. Is it relevant? Is history relevant, for example, or many other things, and so on. But, you know, among all this, of course, we got to have an education which is far-reaching, dynamic, and also very useful to be used. You know, not only, not only for, for practical reasons that we learn things like that, but also for our own uh, curiosity, uh, information and so on that make us a wholesome person. So there are subjects in schools and so on that is required whatever profession you're taking for. For example, humanity, the subject of humanity is to me important whether you want to become a doctor, engineers and so on. Otherwise, you have blinkers in your, in your eyes. You don't see further than that. You don't have a wholesome picture. You don't enjoy the world. I should just give an example, for example, if you have a one-track mind, you, you, you just keep that in, and in the end, you enjoy less in a way. Yeah, you know, and, and you have that kind of people and that kind of education in the countries if the people that govern, if they're educated, if have this, that kind of mind. If they have a liberal mind, they want it to be really to be open to be involved with everything else. And fortunately, architecture is a subject that encompasses in many kind of subject, many kind of knowledges they want. And it is one of the one of the studies, you know, course of study to me is a very wholesome, very open. In, and, and you got to know almost everything, but specializes nothing in the way you could start again. And that's a wonderful thing. So, thank you, Dato. Thank you, Dato. Good afternoon. Uh, can I can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Hijaz. Thank you for that lecture. It was very interesting. Uh, now, my name is Yam. I'm a civil engineer, uh, uh, and of course, the buildings are of interest to me. Like, no, my question is this: uh, with the recent uh, construction of some very large mega high rises in Kuala Lumpur. What is your opinion on the, 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 the impact of such high rises in a city like Kuala Lumpur no? to the urban landscape? <laughs> you know, I, I, I thought we have too many high rise buildings already, yes. but we are still building bigger and bigger ones. Uh, so perhaps maybe uh, I'd just like to know your views on this. Thank you. Okay. Although I'm, I'm good at a high rise building. <laughs> But I, I don't subscribe to really tall building. Uh, to me, it's mega many. And I don't see why we want to make the tallest buildings. You know, uh, 
and I would crit criticize that. One example is at the moment is still being built, very slowly it's been building at the old Merdeka Stadium. I do not know why they want to build tall buildings unless they have inferiority complex. Now, now if you really, you cannot justify it economically. You just imagine that. To do that kind of rice building, high rise building of nearly one, whatever it is. What do, what do our people say? Or the one in power says, oh, you don't have the capability to do it. We got to get outside people to do the job. In fact, that's why they give the job to those people. And then the engineers and so on, also the same thing. They don't have the engineers qualified to do it. And then to go on with that again, it is contractors. Oh, you don't have the contractors capable of doing that. So what that it means, we lost. Our well of the nation is given out that has been shared within the country. The great loss. Now there is a simple economics. Why these people higher up? that thing of it couldn't think like that. Imagine that instead of one building, spread it into 10 buildings. What does it mean? 10 architects who got the job, engineers who got the job, many people, the job is spread out, the well is spread out. Isn't that better? And it will be good too, but then to be these tall, tall structures. And when you shut the leaf at the bottom, it becomes empty, empty at the top. It's completely useless. To me, and that is what my view is. Thank you, thank you. I have to say that I would uh, have this tendency to agree with you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Good. Hello, sir. I have a question. Yes. Uh, my name is Hari Azizan, and I'm studying part one, and currently in my final year. Uh, I would say I would like to say great session indeed, coming from a great person himself, and I am very much interested in your work. So I wonder if he just associate a sub internship applications and if students can apply for it. Yes, of course we do have that. In fact, you know, uh, uh, I think if you have a one of our book, you can see hundreds of people coming through through our firm. In fact, somebody say that we are the we are the second university. After what they graduated, they will come in to get something like that. We're still open to that, not only in the office, of course, we cannot take as many. Uh, <laughs> to pass what our knowledge to the young people. But we also do it in our own house in down here, but we have a big space. So we, we invite artists, performers to come here to practice and helping them and men mentoring them as well. So we are doing that. It, it is part of our giving back to society, what I call. What I have is to give back. There's nothing actually. And including at my age of now is 84, I'm still teaching. I'm still giving lectures to you. Thank you, sir. Just, that's my contribution. All right, thank you. Um, how many questions are we allowed to ask right now? Still can continue? Yes, of course. All right. Um, I think I'm interested on this one question from uh, Renz Irvin Dela. Okay. Any ideas for a hospital that will be human-centered? From Angela, yes. What no, no. Uh, from someone ran named Renz Irvin Dela. Um, she, she or she asks, any ideas for a hospital that would be human-centered? Hospital for human-centered? Yes. Human-centered, people -centered. Yes, I suppose, yes. Yes, that's a hard question. I've got to think about it. You know, what is it human-centered that you are proposing or you're asking? I think, um, I think her, her or his question is somehow has to do with me, I think someone, um, um, hospital that care about the psychology of the patient instead of the aesthetic or the technical stuff of the of right. hospital process. Okay, right. Yes, unfortunately, they were trained as such. You know, they become medical robots, although they're human beings. These doctors, you can see that, you know, they all do 
day to day is the same thing as if, because they're so busy, they say, you know, and they have no time for people as such. And what is the answer to, to that is, of course, because they have more doctors and, and special police, not only concentrated in one big hospital, but it got spread out into clinics, into villages and so on. Then you have more time for interaction between, between doctors and, you know, and patient for that. So it, it means that we got spread out this, this hospital, whether we can do it or not. And we should think about it. It no longer like the city got to be concentrated in one place anymore with all the specialty. It can be diverse. It can be spread out. And you can still link with the with the knowledge of the medical discovery, with research and so on, through digital of course, as today we can do it. So we don't need to have that. It is better to have it spread out uh, rather than to be concentrated in one place. Before, of course, they want to do that because the specialty is there and it means that it becomes economical and so on, but you don't have to have it everywhere. You can spread it out. You can have the special, special one for special purpose, and it can be distant from one place to the other. But the people to people is should be more personal, more in, in you know intimate, rather than it's just like if you are sick, I give you five minutes, you pay me my bill, and that's it. You take a, a pill rather than to know uh, their well-being, where they come from, what happened to their family, and so on. That because they just don't have the time. Uh, it's, it, they, they, that's the problem with it, I think. In other words, it should be spread out, not concentrated. All right. Um, yeah. Okay, I can proceed to another question. Actually, this is also something that come to my mind. Like, I see a lot of competitions about uh, population, population and there is a lot of crowd but when you just simply open Google Earth you find that the earth is so big and then I just wonder why there is lack of space issues like the earth is so big and you can you can spread out the city why there is such an issue that's called pollution there is such things before they call it centrality of space that because People want to be in one uh, center that has everything. The amenities are all there. They want to enjoy it. The work, the opportunities are there. Therefore, they concentrate on that. Because of that, the land prices become, become more expensive if you're spread out. Of course, if you spread out, you have to pay the penalty of distancing. But in the future, in the future, we don't have that problem, as I said. Cybernetics and digitals and so on will help that. You know, so as I say, in the future, I think cities, uh, human settlement will be different than what it is today, if you are consciously to do it. Whether we're going to wait from the Western model to come first, or whether we can start on our own first, is debatable or is questionable. Uh, with all the intellectual we have in this own country and the capability of people, we should strive to be the first one instead of waiting and, and just accumulate. And that is the, 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 the trouble, the land become too expensive. In fact, we got plenty of land, but we got to know how to use the land properly, not just spreading it out and spreading all the infrastructure, which is costly. You know, you, you got to do it differently. It's a small cities probably going around the communities and so on could be a good place. And also we never think of, of living, not just on land, but why not building it on, on the sea, on the water? We never think of it. And yet long time ago, even when I was in school, the great Tango, uh, Kenzo Tange, many of you know who's Kenzo Tange, he's a great Japanese architect, trying to build cities on water on Tokyo Bay. 
but it was not realized. But it was a gem. It was really something altogether. Why use land? Why not use water for your living space or for your activities and so on? And for that matter, which I can show you, we have won the competition for the Penang South to building on waters. That's a competition for urban plan, but we are not allowed to show it to you. Next time, perhaps. Go ahead. All right. Um, again. Hello, Hello Assalamualaikum. Hello, Assalamualaikum. Yes. Uh, yeah, he just professor. Yeah, he just thank you so much for such an inspirational talk. My name is Sharifah Asma. I'm the studio leader of Kalam Reka Studio, who is hosting this uh, talk at the moment, along with um, my uh, co studio leader, Ar Putri Mayang uh, Bajah. Yeah. Um, well, the the reason why uh, we have this series of talk. Um, when we, the students are doing their thesis and they have um, a varied topics for their thesis. For example, some are doing for the disabled, such as the blind. Some are doing for uh, ca uh, cancer patients recovering from cancer. And some are doing for the criminologies. Some are de uh, designing uh, the thesis for disaster. They have such varied uh, topics for their thesis. And since they are in their final semester, and when they started last semester with their uh, inception for the thesis, we, uh, AR Mayang and myself, architect Putri Mayang and myself, uh, decided to have a theme. So since we realized that many of the students are so consumed with uh, the forms and aesthetics, they forgot about designing for people. They forgot about the users who are actually using the building. So we, we, we decided to have this theme, architecture for people. So um, since they are going to go out and become architects of the future, uh, my question is what would your advice be to the students and future architects on how to, you know, inculcate and prioritize this attitude about designing for people, considering uh, the users, putting the sh uh, themselves in the shoes of users. So, you know, in a way, what would your advice be for them and when they go out in the real world and trying to design in the real world? Because now it's the thesis is more from academic aspects, they can dream. But once they go out in the real world, when they face reality, finance, all the other stumbling blocks. So what would your advice be as a very experienced and famous, uh, well-known uh, uh, architect, A.R. Hijaz? Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, when you're in school, you have all the freedoms, uh, which with no consequence in a way, whatever you do. And you should take the opportunity while you are in university or school uh, allowing that you got to follow the syllabus in order to pass your examination and to get your diplomas or degrees, to think differently, even how outrageous it would be, because that can be a test whether for acceptance by the people. And if you want to put the highlight as the people on the top, and therefore, you got to think of whatever subject it is, it got to be centered on the people itself. So there are many ways how you can do it. You know, when you design things, if, if people, they have opportunity in, you are still undergraduate and so on, you should do something outrageous even if it must be, it doesn't matter. You know, as long you follow the syllabus, as long the teachers is kind enough, to see it through that you have the faculty of mind to create, to design, however distant to me. It's, it's just, like a, just like an artist, you know, you, you know how to paint, you know how to compose and so on. And it is up to you to have a creative, creative mind to produce something 
which it can be completely different altogether, as long as it is, it is good for mankind. And that's, that should be the target of that. Um, well, it, you, you have the thesis that you say, some for cancers and so on. And well, that is relevant. But more relevant, I think we should concentrate in a way of, of our cultures uh, to have architecture, culture in our architectures, to have a special aesthetics, you know, uh, buildability, a new kind of technology, building technology uh, that can even be done um, easily by the people to the extent of 3Ds, for example. You know, you have a 3Ds a construction technique today that you can build even big building by these 3D methods. And there are some other people already in the West starting to do it. So this is the kind of thing that you can propose uh, to, to more or less getting out from, from the same track. stereotype. That's what mankind is all about, to create, to find new things, to adventure new things. That's how we discover all the digital things and so in our life because some, some people have that capability to do it and we should be trained to do it. That's most important. At the universities where you can have all the freedom. When in the real life later, you have been restricted in many ways, not only by laws, by your spouses, you know, by many, many other things as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, perhaps you perhaps you can share your experience. Uh, I just when you was graduated as a student and ventured into the real world, what what you went through and uh, to bring where you are today. Perhaps you can share your experience with the students. Thank you. Yes, my college or university is an old fashioned. It follows the trend of the perhaps last centuries. Um, they have the syllabus that follows for the institute, a professional institute that they have to follow, and even the lectures are, are, are very tight to, to follow the program. And I realized that only after the third years of my student day, why should I always want it? Oh, all the students wanted to, to please the lecturers or the tutors just because we want to pass our exam. And that is a time when I have difficulties and I have to change universities for that matter. Because all the time I feel that you have to follow the syllabus, the lecturers, and, and, and the answers will be from what they're asking for. And also this, the design is to follow their trends and so on, or what they think. You cannot think differently all the time. But knowing that, myself because I was a I was a scholarship student which I must pass through that I must go through the syllabus I must follow that only in the back of my mind I say to myself when I have the chance to get away from it and that is when I can do it after graduation I started it even so in real life you can't do it because it dictated by the norms, the norms mean by the conventional, and and it's very difficult to do it. But at the back of your mind, you always trying to do this. The idea is never done. It's only when it's a time to strike. And my opportunity came when I won the international competitions. That is the Malayan banking. That's opened my horizon because I think differently. And that's how it started. And from then on, as they said, it's history. And even today, I still think the same thing. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Um, all right. Okay. I We have two questions that are waiting in the list. Okay. The first, I start with this uh, Aisha Amin. She, she asked, how is architecture for people if it's only accessible by the ables? 
good architecture are built for the few that are able to pay for the price. Advantage can be as well. Uh, ask you to repeat. Sorry. Yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay. Um, the if question if, by Asha Anna. Yeah. Okay. Architecture for people, if it's only accessible by the ables, good architecture are built for the few that are able to pay for the price of it. How does architecture balance out the problem of the remaining population? For the disabled population, there's always the guide and regulation already uh, been enforced in our our architecture to regulation, you know, you've got special toilet, special room for the disabled, but maybe not totally. But it is again a question of economics because the number is small, you know, uh, so they become, they, be, they are being considered, but they are not the highlights for the billing just to be the disabled. So you have to provide that. Unless the number is growing and become bigger, then they take center stage at the moment they don't but we do think of that as i said regulation building regulation architecture and so on incorporate them all right i hope that answers your question aisha okay um sorry before uh next question is from prof madia abdurahi so he said, we appreciate your wise thought and experience in architecture. What is your prediction on architecture education of the future? Technology being dominating the industry tools, should, be, should school be moving into synergizing more technology knowledge into their curriculum or syllabus structure? Your opinion that is much appreciated. Thank you. Yes, that's the big question. Of course, the world is changing all the time and we must follow that trend. Architectural studies and architectural you know, practice will change. Uh, in a long time ago, architect is a symbol of, in a way, prestige. You know, they are the gentlemen, they say, you know, and everybody wants to become like that. You know, uh, architecture before, uh, one band shows more like they do everything in, in the way. They're the great gentlemen and so on. But then the project is small. But today, the projects are big, it needs teamwork, it needs specialization. Architects themselves cannot do it. They got to have others, the engineers take part, all kind of things, all kind of, all kind of expertise. When we did telecom building, for example, uh, not only stop from having engineers, mechanical, electrical, and engineers, and so on, what, what we have to have is specialized people knowing about the management of an office, for example. And that is a new era altogether. So it become more complex in the future. It's bigger and so on. So there's a different dimension, a different problem. And therefore, we must be ready to include this in our study. You know, as I said, architect become a general. You know, it's, it's not in particular to do and you're not ex expert in one thing. So it's all about teamwork. And the bigger the project, the bigger the temple. And it's so complex today. For example, what we did for the new design for the South Island in Penang. We got so many experts of many kinds of geologies, uh, the, you know, the marine biologists, and all kinds of people involved in that. And we have to synthesize that to put all that program into one place to bring out a new kind of being or of architecture. So it needs that kind of thing. So is our syllabus in school. It has changed to what is relevant today. We already changed it uh, with, with, as I said, digital before, with our dress machine and so on. We use computers. You know, we already changed that. So we got to change more as the time goes by to meet the purpose, to meet the time, to meet the era, and to meet the kind of people. And the kind of people are different from country to country. Their cultures are different, their religions are different. You know, their wants and desires are also different. So you must think of that and include that in your design, in future design, anyway. 
Okay. Uh, hello. Yes. Hi, Professor. May I ask? A, uh, may I ask a question? I am yes. Amy from UITM, a lecturer. Uh, I would like to know what do you think about uh, the trend of uh, planning in Malaysia? Uh, what do, do you think that it actually reflect the aspiration, the needs and aspiration of his rakyat? And if you think yes, could you help us uh, to identify? And what 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 is your uh, opinion on that? Thank you. I don't know what they teach in planning at the moment, you know, but the results are not shown. There. For example, you know, the rules and regulation in planning principles and sport follows the old one and so on. You know, there's nothing new, there's not nothing research to be done. And, and there are many things ought to be done, it's not done, and neither are the people involved in planning, in the administration and so on. Change that. They just follow what it is. Is probably it's out of laziness. They just follow it. Town planners, when they go out, they don't design anymore. They just follow the regulation and so on. You know, nobody questions whether the ratio of toilets to people that works there is too much or too small. Nobody, nobody thought about the climate of our country that we need shelters everywhere. Otherwise, with the rain pouring and so on, you cannot cross the road or you cannot go from one place to another place without getting wet. And that's need planning principle, that planning changes in the planning way. Unless you do that, the architect just have to follow that. This is unfortunate about, uh, about, about our planning principles and about, about planning theories and the profession for that matter. That to me has lagged behind. And and as you know, and now is a time with the changes of, as I said, the fourth revolution. How we should plan ourselves, human settlement in the future. How should it be? How should it be? How big it should be to be viable economically and sustainably? How big is it? Anybody making a prediction? or research on that. This is what we are looking forward to. And this is what forever universities should stand for, to do that research, to do that studies. And when they go out, to implement them. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Um, I There's another question, uh, I think from a student. What, from Shaza Harzani. What are your thoughts on introducing and executing co-living among nations? Co-living. Yes. Co-living no. among nations. No, I don't understand that. One thing I will ask my daughter, what is co-living mean? Yeah. What is co-living means? Living together? We are already living together. You're talking about before they got married. Is that what it is? I'm not sure, but yeah, this is the question by Shanta. It's like co-education and co-living, that means you're living together uh, without getting married. But uh, if, you, if that is the question, then the answer is, that's the modern world. Uh, in, in my world, you know, you want to touch a, a girl and so on, you've got to get permission. Uh, you, 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 know, you want to sleep with the opposite sex, you know, you've got to get married. But today, the worlds are different. You don't, you don't have to get married first to sleep together. If that's what uh, you're talking about, and that's it. uh, the uh, answer. I don't know whether that is the answer. My, so, my apology, Prof. Yeah. Uh, architect uh, Hijaz. Yes. I mean, Frazali Aripe. I think <laughs> what, <laughs> what yes. is meant by co-living, if I can uh, yes. okay. it, uh, it's just that uh, sharing spaces for a uh, certain purpose, uh, for example, uh, the office work, office environment nowadays, uh, that uh, people don't need a, 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 a proper office, uh, that uh, the young entrepreneurs, for example, uh, yes. okay. so that kind of co-living, uh, that is in terms of working experience, yes. uh, in terms of office environment. Another aspects of co-living, what if I may interpret of the question is that if you look at the uh, housing development in Malaysia nowadays, this is very stereotype. Uh, 
meaning that uh, if it is a high rise of uh, living, they have a three bedroom all the way from ground floor or first floor till the top floor. So I think there is a need for co-living. That is where uh, I understand uh, what the mm, meaning of right. is about. Where the rich and the poor can live together in whatever forms of architecture that they are trying to create. Wallahu alam. Yes, you are right. That this is the fault that we have today. You know, uh, we separate ourselves between the rich and the poor, between three bedroom and one bedroom. Why is not mingled together? As I said just now, I have my illustration how it could be done. You know, that's an example. Yes, in the future, why can office go beside a living space or vice versa? It can be mixed all together as long how you you can make protect it for privacy, noise, and so on, which in today's technology, you can, you can do that. Certainly in the future, it should be in that direction. This is what I said in, in the last of the, of the lectures, you know, in the future, it must take a different way because of the new technology that we possess, because of this new revolution. We are no longer living like it was before. We can mingle together, work together, and have mixtures of workplace and so on. And if, if that can be done, it's the most economical way that you can achieve because your travel distance is not very low. You're not wasting energy, not wasting it's a lot for them. You can gain a lot. Indeed, it is for the future what we should look forward. Yes, if that's what co-living you mean, I certainly agree with that and support that. And in fact, we are beginning to design like that. So that will start with our program in order to function, to exercise that. Our bylaws, building bylaws, our planning principles must change that. Otherwise, the architects cannot fulfill it. All right. Um we proceed to the next question for okay. uh, From Norwina Mohamed Nawawi, I guess. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Architect Hijaz. Lovely to listen to you again, having years of experience with the many clients. How and when were you able to detach yourself from the ones of the client's ideas to your ideas? Thus, research as we are giving to our students as knowledge based students will assist students in the future. Yes, that's always a drop. That's always the difficulties that many architects face. Unfortunately, I'm being blessed in some way, not altogether. When I have difficult clients, I'm trying to take time to explain to them, and in fact, do several sketches and to show them the pros and cons of each although I have to work doubly hard twice sometimes to do it, but, but I allow my time to do that. Fortunately, during my time, it's not like today, the client will give you the brief, this is what they want and so on. In my time, they, I get a free hand, a cut, not quite cut blanche. They get the free hand, except this, except for the budget, they'll do that. I give you an example. When they asked me to do Tabong Haji, this is a nice story to tell. They give me 60 million to build. Right. But they want something completely different, they said. They don't want to be looked as an orthodox. You know, they want to be forward. They want to show me the future of. Islam universe, uh, Islam architecture. Show me the new ways and so on if you can. And that is, although it's, 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 it's cut blunt in that way, it's a very difficult to achieve in a way. But however, we took the task. We did it. We did it in several schemes, you know, and we, we analyzed it, what is Islamic architecture? And we take the gist of it, the five principles of Islam, the oneness with God, 
the purity, the geometry, and these are the essentials of, of Islamic. So we try to incorporate that what we can to make a modern um, office building and with that tight space as well to do that. And that's how, how, how we try to manipulate it. In the end, we have three schemes and choose only one and go for presentation. And when I want to present this, I was not sure whether they can be accepted or not. So when we present that with a committee, it's a mixed committee of the orthodox and the unorthodox uh, board of, of directors at that time, I was not sure. So here we were, I explained, the first thing I explained, sir, forgive me, I said, you're giving me 60 million as a budget, but has gone to 19 million. But it has been designed economically, what we have our quantity survey to support it. It is not overland this. It is equated to the volume, to the areas of the buildings. But it has gone over budget. So I was not sure whether we have gone beyond the scope. So I have to present that, which with my model, which I encased it, covered it, the cloth. Then I said, here is the building that you asked me to do. So I lift it up like a magician. And the board of directors was so quiet. And I did not know whether I lose you or not. The next thing I heard is that, when can you build it? And you know, that was fantastic. I never believed they can be accepted. Such an, in a way, avant-garde building is completely different from what they ever see or experience before. And that is Tabung Haji. That's how it can come up. Sometimes we have the opportunity, I'm saying that when you have the opportunity, deal with it, strike it. But what, when you don't try to explain it so that the other people can understand. And in between that, you will achieve that. Many people ask me the same thing. He just, he said, you got all the plum job. They, is, they, they do, you do whatever, whatever you want. Not, sometimes you get away with it. Not so, not easy. I have to explain sometimes. I have to go on. I have to do many skills in order to achieve it. But when they see something stunning, something different, and that's the wow factor that you want. That's what they're looking in order to keep their status up. That's what they're looking for. Same thing with um, telecom building. They want, they say, the arts of architecture. And this is why we get all kinds of consultants to do really new kind of approaches, not only in terms of image, but in terms of their functions. For example, the air conditioning, for example, is not coming from the top, but from the bottom, on the floor, on the... And why? Because computer generates heat, and therefore you should have the cold, if possible, air is from below, from below your feet. And that's how we got away with it, go to explain that, why it is like, why it should be like. And it is the first building, perhaps in the world for that matter, have gardens in every three floors of this building for them to, do, to go out to refresh them or even smoke if they still have to smoke to get out. And sometimes you have the opportunity and you do it. And you don't worry about it. You know? And of course, you got to adjust later on here and there, you know, to do that. And quite often, as I said, building for the people, although it is just for the particular people, the office of the people, I introduce concert hall in that area, places for people, the garden for people outside, it, shops and so on, in order to bring people in, just not for the people involved in the business of telecom. But unfortunately, that constant hall is not in use. The same thing with many other buildings. We try to induce 
other factors in a way so that we can the people can enjoy it, not that particular people, the building, the purpose of the building for. So many of the building that you see that we did in in the city, the town, we, we did the ground area especially is open for the public. Okay, right. Uh, Prof Hijaz, I want to, I want to ask one more question. Now, when I think about when I think about implementing what I learned from this lecture of how to design for a good city for people, mm -hmm. I think we don't have much power as a graduate student because we are not yet have power to design cities, but we probably have power to design small house. So on the, on the scale of a small house, what can we do instead of a big city? What can we do on a single house? Like what are the essential elements that we can understand to design a good house? Since we are still graduate architects, we don't have power to design cities. Of course. Of course, in the beginning, you got to start from small. I did start small in a way in Malaysia. I did nothing, just a small renovation for a clinic. That's how small. And then it grew into bigger things and so on. Yes, you have the chance to do it. That's the beginning, how you do it. Even you do a house, how do you place the house? Again, not only the normal thing that you learn, orientation and so on. The places, how you should look at and whether there's area, good area and bad area, how you relate your building to your neighbors and so on that will make into a place, a space and so on. And that is important as from the small one, when you have a group of building, it become bigger and bigger. And bigger. Although these small entities, they are part of the bigger thing, these small entities. So you start from that, you start from the thinking right. How will you do it? How to make it? But the question is, is it possible to, for example, summarize it for us in six, maybe six points or seven points that that can make it clear, just like how you summarized a good city, like a city that have a hospital, uh, institutional, uh, greenery, you summarized all the factors. So is it possible like to give us like hit points so we can clearly understand what are the things that I have to check in my design? So, so it's considered a design for people. I think it's quite elementary. You have been taught that how to design a house. You know, in the beginning, you use a bubble diagram, the hierarchy of places, ways you put from one place to the others, and and how to build it economically, and how how to please the people that live in it. You know, what are they looking for? What is the aspiration? and what is the aesthetic values and so on. If you really go deeper into that and so on, and you're clever enough to decipher it, you can come up with it. That is the factors they want. You can't say that to do this, you've got to be A, B, and C, and E. Yes, that's we call prototype. Yes, you can have a prototype, this is what quality, but in the end, is the interpret interpretation of the artist. You, the architect is the artist to do, a special building for these people, for their aspiration. How you interpret that? Nobody going to tell you that. The technology, yes, the technology is fixed. You can do even the technology can be in many ways. Even the material you choose can be many things that reflects different things. And then you got to bring up the cultures of the people. How do you bring some entities, some identity, rather than? You know, otherwise you just build a box. And a box is, is also with good climate inside it, with everything inside it. It's, it's a machine for living, but that's not enough for people. People have their aspiration. People have their aesthetic values. And that's what they are looking for. And they ask you to do it for them. But most of them don't ask for them. I just need a roof over my head, that's all, a shelf is this. But some of them, that's really, you know, special architects and so on will do differently with that and come up with different results. You, you may ask either a house or anything by different architects will produce differently. Although they've been subjected in a way 
by rules and regulation, by technologies, but they are the spirit aesthetic and the souls are different altogether. And if you only can pattern that, you can come out differently. Your small house is the beginning of, of individual people, I see. But how this small house can commune and interact with another building to make it a whole into a community that for not only for you, for your surrounding people and for your neighbors that's coming together. And that is got to be mindful in a way. And that in a way been detected by our planning principle. It's certain thing that you can't do. You got to have set back so many feet by the side and the back and so on. That's what it is. And that sometimes we got to break that to find into something. At one time to do individual house, it's been restricted in, in a sense. And in Malaysia, for example, even they have symbol. For example, Malay house in the past, only for the rich people, they say, can adopt with three pitch roof. The others cannot have it, have only one pitch roof. The other adult, as they call it, the custom, is a 12 tiang. That has been the protocol in a way, the Malay house, apart from lifting from the ground. And the Malay house has also certain features that the entrance must be only from the front. The back is for the female gender. But today is a different world. You can approach the house from the front, from the back, from the top, from the bottom. It's much more flexible. And it is up to the architects how to do this to make the best of it. And the most important is how it can be togetherness with all the others to relate it. Okay. All right. Um, we are going to ask another two questions and then we're going to end this Q&A session. Sure, right. Thank you. I all enjoy right. it, no worry. All right, it's okay. I'm afraid everyone, uh, you are tired of it. Okay. So we, we go with Ken Huating question. This is a current issue. The current water cuts, pollution, and congestion in the Klang Valley are signs that urbanization has reached its limit for this economic region. The optimal city size in the context of Industrial 4.0 is likely to be different from those of Ebenezer Howard era, etc. How do we determine the optimal city size in view of digitalization trend, e-commerce, Industrial 4.0? Thank you. Yes, that's a relevant question. So, and it is, it is embodied in my lectures just now, you know, how big the city is going to be and how small. Of course, why the cities are big? Because they have uh, the economic uh, to provide all the amenities that required for really big cities. And so, so these become big, but that's no longer functional at the time because the distance to travel is too far that you've got to use cars and so on. So in the future is is to find the optimum livable human size of, of, of settlement or cities, you know, that can embody all the cultural, intellectual needs and so on in that small area, as long they can be viable. A small city sometimes cannot be viable to have good or many amenities to have, for example, gallery or theaters, uh, they can't afford it. So what size of the cities can afford that? Uh, without uh, distancing with, with transportation, you know, part of it to do. And that is what we should search for as, 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 as a city for tomorrow, as architecture for tomorrow. Okay. All right. Um, we have come to the last questions. Hopefully, this is the last questions. Hi, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Muhammad Adam, student UPM MR, Malaysia. It's expected to be an aging nation by 2030. What is your advice for future architects when designing for the future in terms of urban planning, transportation, and etc.? We have to follow our culture. Fortunately, in Malaysia, 
we were born to look after our fathers and the elderly. That has been like that. And we hope it keep on like that. It means that in our house, we have to allow for this. Although you want to separate them sometime to have privacy and so on, you can build a house with an attachment for your, the elderly. So the elderly don't have to go into the old age of houses and so on, into the compartment like that. But if you have to do it, then you have to do it. Uh, because for whatever reason it may be. But fortunately enough, our culture is still intact at the moment. We look after our elderly. And for that, you have to provide them, except sometimes you want to separate them. Separate them at some time, so you want to do, to do that. So you've got to build uh, your house that can be expandable, can be small, can be constructible, and so on. So it's more flexible in the kind of design. Right. All that, right. That, All I, right. Uh, mm. Any other questions from somebody else? Hi, Arijas. Yes. Okay, I'm Muhammad Wise from UITM. So, <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, I can. Hey, in your lecture, you show the comparison between sprawling city and the compact city. Yes. So nowadays what we can see in Malaysia, we used to driving for one, two hours to work because of the sprawling city concept. Yes. So what I believe, uh, the sprawling city concept, uh, maybe because uh, the people cannot afford uh, to stay in the city because of cost of living is very high. And then uh, added to the public transport uh, access and also... Uh, uh, the factor of our weather is very humid, different, different, uh, different to the Western uh, country. So my question is, will the idea of compact city where we have a walking and dis uh, cycling distance uh, work in Malaysia in future and how uh, to overcome all this uh, factor of restriction? Thank you. Yes, you, you already know the melodies, the four. Uh, of the big sprawling cities that we allow ourselves to do it. In fact, if you think clearly that if we don't have motor cars, there won't be a sprawling city. Think of it. If there's no motor car, you know, the comfort and, and the prosperity to have it, there's no sprawling city as, as it was before. Because of that, you do that. It is in the city that can afford all the grandeurs, all the amenities, all whatever the enjoyment for the people. But small city cannot do it. And this is why everybody converging in the city and living outside, it, which is not a good example. And this is the example, as you can see throughout the world, California for that matter, um, Australia and many other people. And today it's of course, and not before in China, in Shenzhen, they got to distant after so many miles to go to the city, but not before, because the city was small and everybody in that. And there is opportunity for them to distance themselves, to have conservation outside the city, in other words, dispersing it, decentralize it. But they follow the wrong principle. And now this, they suffer from it. So now we have to remake that. As I repeat again, this is a time for us to relook re over that point. And this is the time for us to do it. And oh, we, Nico. we have the tools and the capability to oh. do this. And also, you know, uh, of what you can think of after this pandemic, something will happen. And we are looking forward to that. And in, in a way, you know, these civilizations or the changes of, of living and so on has gone very rapidly. Over the hundred years, repeat itself very quickly from one thing to the other, the developments I'm talking about, that, that change our life from radios, from telegraph, telephone and so on, televisions, and now we have 
digitals and so on, that will change again. And this is what is going to be, I think, in the future. Right, any more? I, I think we can come to the end of the event. We can answer another question. So, um, I'm sorry for those for the question that cannot be answered. I hope there will be another session we can have with AR Hijaz, inshallah, soon. Um, so, um, now we have reached our end of the program. Before we end, I would like to invite the program coordinator Bachelor of Science, Honest Architecture, Ermayam Bahja Zahri, for closing remarks. Thank you, Izian. All right, Shukur Alhamdulillah. Um, Prof, thank you so much. That was uh, a wonderful, informative, and a very inspiring talk. Um, sharing your thoughts and also your experiences. That's something that the um, students and all of us actually were looking forward to. Anyway, um, perhaps this is something that uh, we should think about, yeah, um, about how to design this future of our cities, the future of our lives, and perhaps what's in store for us in the future. Anyway, on behalf of the um, organizer, Center of Studies for Architecture, and also the Faculty of Architecture, Planning and Surveying, UITM Puncha Alam, we would like to thank um, adjunct professor, architect Hijaz Kasturi, for lending us um, his time to be with us today. Uh, shukur alhamdulillah. Yeah, um, actually the initial plan was to actually have a face-to-face -face session, but um, due to the unforeseen uh, circumstances, um, we had to change our plan. But again, shukur, uh, we are here today meeting online. Anyway, um, I would like to thank the organizer, Kalam Reka Studio for the outstanding work and dedication in organizing to this event. Um, congrats, uh, you did a good job. And to all the participants, thank you so much for joining us um, till we meet again. So back to you, Izian. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ar Mayang. All right, um, if anyone available, can we switch on the camera to screenshot the screen for a memory, if you don't mind. Uh, Yes. All right. What do you want to do? Yeah, taking a photo, I think. The MC is on mute. Mm. Sorry for us. Hello, Yan. Done. I'll pass to you. All right, thank you. So, um... And that sums up all the talk for today. Thank you on behalf of the Grandesi team. Thank you to everyone in the sharing session for allocating time in their busy schedule to participate. From the bottom of my heart and all those who are involved in organizing this talk, especially Kalam Rika Studio, thank you very much. And for information, this talk will be recorded and will be posted on Arkisa YouTube channel. So if there is a question, um, you can leave there and I can proceed uh, past to your hijas, inshallah. So last but not least, let us end this event with um, Surah Al As. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope there will be um, next time you can meet, inshallah. So thank you and assalamualaikum. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.